So today's session is going to be delivered by uh, Lukeman uh, Agbogan, who is a tech lead at Mindera, Waitrose and Partners in the UK. So he has a wide uh, range of uh, skills and expertise. Uh, so he has IT skills. And if you look at his uh, CV or his LinkedIn profile, you will see that it spans a number of programming languages, a number of uh, different frameworks and tools. Uh, so that would be like C Sharp, Java, SQL, API testing, JSON, Selenium, and so on. Then in the business side of uh, things, uh, he has uh, involved himself in a number of different uh, roles, project management, project planning, people management, agile delivery, risk management, agile coaching. And in fact, uh, he's very enthusiastic about promoting agile software development and testing. And uh, uh, today's talk is also kind of related to that. So previously, before joining Mintra, he worked in MHR uh, as a senior software developer and uh, delivery lead. In Thomson Reuters, he was a senior QA engineer. In terms of education, he has a master's degree uh, from the Nottingham Trent University and a bachelor's degree from the University of uh, Wales. So with that short introduction, uh, yeah, over to you, Lukman. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and um, pleased to meet you all. So I'm Luke Menagogun, uh, a delivery lead at Mindera, and currently contracting with uh, Witros. And like you said, my background is in quality and software testing, uh, predominantly in test automation and test tooling, and in the later stage uh, of test management. So prior to Mindera, um, I work for a software house called MHR, and it is at MHR that I had the opportunity to, ex to experience our first time implementation of Shift Left. So at the time, I was the test engineering manager. So I played a significant role uh, in driving the strategy from planning to implementation. So I'm going to share my experience uh, with you all today. Uh, but before we get into the nitty gritty of that, so I would like to, um, to tell you a few things about me as a person. And this is a way uh, from my professional life. So just bear with me, let me share my screen, then we can get started. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. All right, so about me, I'm a software quality advocate uh, this is my passion. This is my, uh, you know, things that can get me going. I can discuss quality and software um, testing all day without getting bored. So I'm a husband and a father of two lovely kids. Um, beside me there is Naima and behind me is uh, Farida and obviously my lovely wife. So this is uh, one of our pictures during uh, last Christmas. I support uh, my United, uh, yeah, the, the football club in Manchester. And uh, yeah, we, we're coming up now and we're coming good, hopefully uh, long with that continue. I equally play active football and tennis. Yeah, I can somewhat say, yeah, I'm quite good in football and tennis, uh, but yeah, I don't know what I would say about, about me on that, but I think I'm decent. So I was born in Nigeria uh, to Yoruba tribe. So because of that, I love spicy food, just like the Indian guys. And I love hot weather as well because of where obviously where I come from in Africa. And uh, I have a really, really uh, keen interest in stocks and uh, property investment. So yeah, that is um, a bit about me, uh, guys. Now you know uh, one or two things about, about myself. So that, now let's get into the agenda of the day. So yeah, like I said, I'm gonna talk you through um, how we implemented uh, shift left uh, within the company MHR. So what what really triggered us to start thinking about shift left? So what we had uh, before shift left adoption, I'm going to discuss that. And um, once that's done, uh, we'll discuss shift left ad adoption in terms of the challenges that we that we had uh, during the implementation and how we navigated uh, through those uh, storms. And then the outcome of the implementation. And after that, we're going to discuss a few uh, myths um, and we'll bust those away and what to avoid uh, if you're thinking of implementing a shift left in your company. 
So pre-shift lift, we had so many different uh, problems, but a few of them are the ones that I've obviously uh, highlighted here. And um, first, of the, first, of, uh, first and foremost, we have a lot of inconsistent and unreliable tests. So this is where um, we always have tests failing frequently every night because we run our tests uh, nightly. Then you come in the morning, you see loads of test failure and you say, okay, why are these tests failing? Then you start digging and uh, doing some investigation. At the end of it, you realize, okay, the application is fine. It's just the tests are badly written or maybe some network is did overnight. That's why the tests are failing. And this happens so consistently and make the test so inconsistent. So we face that and as a test manager, it's not what you want to see. You get into the dashboard and everything is red or fewer, fewer. And we run our tests in different pipelines then. We use Azure Dev Test Lab to run some of some of our .NET tests are there and we run all our Java test on the um, Azure. So test takes too long is another issue that we had. And again, our test, like I did tell you that we run them overnight. So we start 6 uh, p.m. In the, in the evening and uh, we resume work around 8, 8, 8 in the morning. But you still see some of these tests or still obviously we run them, we stagger them, we run them in parallel and some of them are staggered. So you come in the morning around 8, few of them would have finished but some we get into around 9 or 10 before they all completely finish of course you can still see some of the results for those that are that's finished but the ones that are still running rest until they finish running you wouldn't be able to see so overall this takes around 15 to 18 hours um before we can get our test results so that is just way too long and uh because we want things to speed to be to speed up very quickly so that wait time was just too long for us Another issue that we had um, that is moving us or shifting us towards trying to start thinking about shift left is test failures investigation is cumbersome and time consuming. Yeah, a lot of uh, once the test engineer come in the morning, they start, uh, they look at the dashboard, a few, few failures, they need to do some investigation. And this investigation is really, really cumbersome. It takes a lot, a lot of time for them. Like say, maybe like, you have a some tests are like thousands, maybe 3,000 there, but you might have 1,500 failing. You know how much investigation you need to do on that. And that's not, that's not really good. It's wasting a lot of time on that. And I think we need to do something different. So another issue that we had, we usually uh, work in sprints and which is every two weeks, but we can release immediately after the sprint. We need to wait for another one week in the sense that we run our regression test and that takes one week to run because it's a lot of manual testing going on there. Why? Because we cannot rely on our automation tests because of the reason I've, I've listed above. So again, so that means every three weeks, that's when we can um, ship to the to production to ship new new features or fixes and stuff like that. That is just too long for us. And we're thinking of, okay, what can we do to reduce this? Again, those are the things that's moving us towards shift left. Lots of confidence in test results. You can't blame the stakeholders uh, when it's okay. Your test is constantly failing. That means they lost confidence in, in our automated test, sadly. So the change. After all those issues, we know we needed to change. So what do we need to change? Where then we had to like get ourselves in the room, myself and the other um, stakeholders, sit down and picture in our head where are we now and where do we want to be? So we realized that where, where we are now, we had a lot of reliance on our end-to-end -end test. And like I did say, majority of these, especially during regression, is manual. And that, that is a lot of reliance on manual testing. A lot of, and our automated test, of course, we have some service um, layout automated tests, but like I did say, they're very, very unreliable. And our unit test, we don't have that many design no there's no test that happens in design at that stage your requirement you could see from the bar there's no test that really happens very little and, and discovery minimum um testing happens there so we want to be where we can flip things over where we have a lot of tests happening right from the start when the product owner or business analyst or be it whoever comes to the team and say, I'm thinking of this new initiatives, I'm thinking of this new idea. At that stage, we want to plug in our quality gates. 
And these are all static testing. You don't even write, write any line of code. But as a, as a test-driven company or a, a shift left test approach company, this is where you start implementing the testability. When you, you sit down in the room with the, um, obviously with the business discussing the, uh, the new features that is coming along, that is where you start asking questions, asking probing questions, bring questioning testability within that requirement. And that is how we can start obviously plugging in quality. And that is where we're thinking now, this is where we want to be. In design phase, where we start coming with the architectural design and all of that, we want to be plugging in a lot of testing in that stage. And again, we're trying to increase the number of our unit tests that we have once we get into that stage. If you could see from the from the other side where we were, the unit test level is very, very low. We want to bump that hole because we want to have a lot of unit tests because that is uh, where we want to be. And in terms of service tests, yeah, we want to have those as well. But we don't have we don't want that to to be more than the unit test because the unit test is where we want to have a lot of those because they are very 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 quick to run and this massive difference is from the end to end it's gone so down we don't want to rely anymore on manual testing and we don't uh, we just want to reduce the number of um end-to-end -end testing that, that we're going to have and shift things high up in the discovery phase so we had that and we know, okay, we know what we want and we know how we want to, how we're going to navigate it is the next uh, question that we want to have. Then we start, okay, brainstorming and see how can we get to where we want to be. Now we know where we want to be. How can we get there? Shift left adoption. Of course, there are different challenges uh, that we had. A few of them are these. And how did we mitigate those challenges? We had a lot of pushback. And this uh, came from the uh, dev community and the test community because people were saying, especially the devs, say, oh okay, my God, you're going to give me a lot of more work. You had into my workload and you want me to move faster. That is impossible. How can I do this? So, and the test team, they were so paranoid and they felt, oh, you're going to take my job away from me. You gave it into the dev. So what am I going to be doing? So we had a lot of pushback uh, uh, based on this. And another factor uh, that we or challenges that we faced were anxiety and fear. A lot of people, a lot of people were so anxious. They were so paranoid and um, they were so fearful of their job in the sense that they think they're going to lose their job. And uh, yeah, a lot of them obviously yeah, come knocking on my door, really, really worried. And it is not a good place to be as a company uh, when you're trying to drive a move. And you're selling this kind of thing but yeah this is from my from my experience uh with what we did in mhr we had a lot of this and unfortunately we had attrition because uh people were so so scared and they think they're going to lose their job so before that happened some people left uh well unfortunately some people left but yeah that's the reality of what happened to it, it doesn't mean it's going to happen to everyone that tried to uh you know to go in the direction of shift left then the quality control during transition. This is another thing that was challenging in the sense that where you used to be in terms of the way you write your test or the way of work and all of that and where you want to be during that transition, the quality control, you need to ensure that people are really in the place where they understand what they need to do. Otherwise, we can, you can end up in a very, very messy situation and you wouldn't want that. So the quality control um, during transition is something that could be very challenging. Then uh, the biggest of, of all is the mindset and the cultural change. Because again, Shiftlet is all about mindset. You're changing people's mindsets. And here it is not so easy. So we face a lot of, cha a lot of challenges on that, trying to change people's mindset. And uh, some mindset you still don't get that changed, but that will be left to those people to make the choice of, rather moving on or trying to, you know, go ahead with what the direction the company is heading. And now uh, we, we had a few, few issues from the, um, from the hierarchy at the top, but again, how we navigated that through uh, to change that culture, to buy into what we're trying to sell, I'm going to discuss it in the mitigation um, section. So how did we mitigate this? A lot of education needs to happen. We had to educate uh, a lot of, uh, of the stakeholders uh, from top to the bottom. People need to understand 
what value are you trying to bring on board by going shift left? So you need to make people understand what problem you're trying to solve. That is the only way people are going to buy into. If you don't educate people, it is going to be so difficult to implement. But educating people is not enough. You need to upskill people because, again, what we end, what we end up doing was we had to uh, repurpose a few roles. And what that means is somebody is doing something before, but you repurpose it a little bit to do something uh, slightly different. And you, they need to be skilled in that new thing you want them to do. So they need to be trained. Both developers, both, uh, I mean, both developer and tester, we had to send them on, on um, different trainings for them to be uh, up, up to uh, the scratch, to be up to speed with uh, what we want them to do. And again, reassuring people it is very, very important because, like I said, people are so anxious, we are so fearful, but you, you're not just going to talk to them once and you think, oh, they'll be, they'll be okay. You need to have that constant reassurance, make sure it's going on. Uh, that is the only way that you can put people's mind at rest because if people's mind are not at rest, you face the risk of not getting the best out of them. And again, your shift left might not be successful. So again, another thing that's very important is transparency. You need to be absolutely transparent with people. You cannot have a hidden agenda behind your shift left. You need to call black, black, call white, white. What are you trying to get out of it? Why you bring a shift left on board and stuff like that needs to be communicated across to people. And again, continuous communication as you journey through the shift left implementation, as you're making good milestone, as you're having any challenges and stuff like that, as things come along, you need to be able to discuss with people. You need to be able to let keep people in the loop so that they know what is going on. And last but not the least, which I have a separate uh, slide for, is the implementation principles. So with the shift left principle, what we had to do was, yeah, we gathered together um, different stakeholders from different um, discipline to discuss how could we stamp uh, a principle in place that's going to help us to drive uh, this uh, shift left uh, implementation. So um, we came up with test is written at the lowest level possible. And from the previous slide I've shown you, our unit test needs to be the highest number of tests that we've got. And that is what our first line is saying. You need to always climb. But before, before shift left, or unit test, yeah, it's not, it's not that much. But this is one of our first principle. The unit test has to be the highest level of test. So test is written at the lowest level possible. Write once, run anywhere. So our tests are not tied down to an environment. You write test once and you have the configuration to point to different environments. You can run the test in dev, you can run it in um, QA, you can run in pre pro you can run in staging environment, you can equally run in production. So they are not, they are environment independent, they're not tied down to any environment. Another uh, principle that we put in place is quality first approach. So um, this is where we're saying a tester gets involved with the product team right from discovery stage. Once the initiation comes into place, you say, okay, yeah, I have an idea. I want to build whatever that thing is. Right from that time you're having that conversation, the test representative needs to be involved so that it can plug in quality gate, testability, and at this stage, they're all static testing. Product is designed for testability. You want this is mindset. You want your developers as they're thinking of, you know, they're in their room discussing about the solution, how we're going to, you know, uh, solve this problem, whatsoever, how we're going to code it. You need to start thinking about how I'm going to test it. How I'm going to make this my code testable. So testability is tied down with your codability as well. So test code is treated as product code. Again, we uh, when you're doing your PR review, you you know when you're writing your test, you're writing your code, you're following the same principle, solid principle, clean code practices, and all of those things. You need to include them with your test code, not just the product code. So you treat them the same way. Testing operations and infrastructure is the responsibility of test engineering unit. And what I mean by this is. 
because again, this is where we have to like upskill people because people before maybe they only writing. It might be different from different uh, organization, or maybe our test engineer before they were skilled in just writing tests and stuff like that. But we have very few of them that can that work at platform level that can you know orchestrate um obviously. DevOps and um, builds pipeline and now uh, spring up a new framework of, from scratch. So we had to then retrain people to be able to do that because what we want our test operation and infrastructure to do is orchestrate the pipeline and now uh, help the developer to move quicker. So we don't have the test engineering unit has nothing to do with writing tests anymore, but they had to be working on test infrastructure and operation. So testing becomes uh, test coaches. Again, this is more to the test analysts and the, and, and the test engineers, a bit of them, where now, because developers are developers, they don't have that mindset of testability. They, not every developer, of course, but we have uh, some of the developers that are really good at testing as well, but the majority of devs are they're not quite, they don't have, you need to, you need to uh, encourage them or maybe you need to like try and convince them before they understand, okay, yeah, I have to have this my test mindset. And this requires training. So that is what the test team is for, to train the developer's mindset, to make them understand that testability and testing is really, really important as coding. So test engineering focus shift to enhance developers' productivity. Then again, this is okay. You have that pipeline, it's been orchestrated for devs to use, to write a test and all of that, but the uh, test engineers or test engineering team need to understand that we don't want our build to take too long to run. So it is their responsibility to ensure that when a build is taking too long, they need to find, they need to do something about it and make it uh, to be as quick as possible. If there's any build issues, that is the test engineering problem. It's not devs problem anymore. So that is another principle that we put in place. And test and development are inseparable. So what we're saying here is you, you once you start to write your code, your product code, at the same time you're writing your test code, they are not separate thing. They are the same thing. So as you're thinking about how I'm going to write my code, you need to start thinking about I'm going to test this code. So if you see them as one thing, then that solves a lot of problem. And ownership of testing resides with developers. Test engineers or test analysts do not write code, do not write test code anymore. This is not the responsibility of a developers. So those are the principles that are put in place to drive our shift left approach. Please feel free to ask me any question. Uh, if you raise your hand, I'm not gonna see because I've only have one screen here. So you feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions so far. So continuous testing pipeline. So this is when I said, okay, yeah, the test engineering team, they're the one now are building our pipelines and all of that. So I'm just gonna quickly run you through how our pipeline was at that time. So changes come through uh, PR, it goes before any code gets into the uh, into our Git repo. Before that is committed to master branch, we fire, we trigger all these tests in different um, ways. So the unit test starts, and the service test they are all run in parallel. And until all of this, and this test, the, the good thing is, all these tests finish in less than seven minutes. Most of them five minutes they're done. Sometimes a uh, max of seven minutes. So these tests are finished in seven minutes all this and there are thousands of tests and that is to tell you how much work has gone into this and that is to tell you how how uh, performant those tests are and uh do you get it so yeah so we run the new unit test we run the service test and we run integration test and engine test and these are different tests there's no duplication across all these layers and um once that's done if everything turns green then the code gets into a uh, master branch. And at the back of that, this is repeated again, because at the back of the uh, code being committed to master, that triggers a deployment into QA, and this test again runs in QA after the deployment. So once, once that finishes, it triggers another one to run in a staging environment. And once that, once that finishes and everything is successful, then the code gets deployed into production. 
at the, at the point of getting the plane to production, yeah, there is a, there, there is a wait there that somebody needs to say, okay, yeah, approve it, and that just goes to production. But everything and all this takes maximum of around 25 minutes. Sometimes it, it, could, it could take as less as 15 minutes. And this is us moving from three weeks to ship our uh, code into the uh, production to max of 25 minutes. And we couldn't achieve that if not for shift left. And again, we run us, you run our code, I mean, you run the test on every commit. This happens every, so we, we, we can deploy as many times as possible in a day. And the, our code is always production ready. If your code is not production ready, you can't commit it because it's going to fail anyway and it's going you it won't get committed so once this production once you commit your code everything is okay it should be production ready and that's how it goes into production so again yeah we run like i said we run everything uh from uh dev environment to staging environment and dev are the one that writes this test code but they obviously this the structure you see in there has been orchestrated by our test engineering team and now uh, again, well, what the test engineering team looks after, it looks after the production monitoring and, 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 and alerting. So that's another um, kind of work that they do. So the outcome of this is um, obviously cost optimization. So which is really good for the business. It, um, it means that it costs less for the business or for them to, to produce software for a customer. And we have a shorter release cycle in the sense that our, our we have improved lead time. Once you raise the ticket to get that ticket done to production, the cycle time has massively reduced. It might be called before, it could take from, like I said, it could take maybe depends on the on, on the size of the ticket, but sometimes it might take maybe less than around three weeks. That's a minimum of a minimum of three weeks to max of maybe months but now it doesn't take more than two two to three days to get everything done from when you raise your ticket but the actual cycle time is, is it's around the day because we have very very small small ticket better and balanced test coverage again yeah because um everybody has been involved right from time and the, our developer has been well trained and coached on testability and understanding how to test we just have a well-balanced test coverage and without any duplicate of effort across different layers of the application. The dev writes all sort of tests. They write a unit test, they write service test, integration test, and our end-to-end -end test. Of course, the end-to-end -end test, which is more of the on the UI, this is written by the um, our web developers because they have their unit test and, and, and the end-to-end -end test. But everything else is written by our backend, uh, backend devs. Improved team collaboration. We have massively improved team collaboration right from uh, the product team collaborating with the uh, UX team, collaborating with the security team, with the test team and the development team. So once we have a new initiative or, or a new idea, a new ticket, everybody come together, collaborate together, start thinking of different things on the ticket right from day one. And this has improved us massively, it's improved the quality of our, of our software. Test teams uh, become more involved with product decision um, from start again, yeah. And uh, at the end, what did we gain? We gain happy customers because we have less production issues. And before Shipler, we used to have massive production issues, different customer cases and stuff like that. But after the implementation of this, we have minimum, minimum, minimum uh, customer, uh, customer cases. Not to say we don't, we still don't have them, but when you're having like hundreds of customer cases in a month to having just two in a month, that is a massive, massive, massive difference. So Boston emits are uh, in shift left. Of course, we had different uh, concerns at the start of our uh, implementing shift left approach. Uh, a few of them were definitely saying, oh boy, this is gonna slow us down simply because yeah, you ask him to do more work so how can I move fast and this is going to, you want to go far, but you're giving me more work, you're taking off work from Kiwi, then I'm going to be slowed down. If you look at, if you look at it from, from myopic um, lens, you might see, yeah, they have a point. But what shift let we give you is going to give you, 
you're going to obviously have to move slowly at the start. In the short term, you'll be slow, but in the long term, you'll be super, super fast. So you need to understand that you're going to move slow in order to be able to move fast in the future. So it's not so that is a myth that's going to slow down delivery. From our experience, it doesn't because before it was three weeks, now we can deploy in less than 25 minutes. Key ways are no longer needed. That is another myth. That is not true. Because again, when you say ship, so, oh, you're taking away my job, you're giving my, you're giving my responsibility to them, and what am I going to do? As a, as a key way, I'm not going to have any job. And people become so fearful, you know, so it was, it was not really a good place to be. But the truth of the matter is that is not the case, at least from my experience, is that's not the case at all. Because what we have to do is just to reprioritize or to repurpose repurpose is the right word it's to repurpose the work of our key ways you know becoming an infrastructure engineer test infrastructure engineers rather than becoming you know writing test code they don't do that again they help to enhance the productivity of, of, of the developers and the test analysts obviously involving right from start understanding more about the product and driving the product testability and at the same time becoming test coaches so they've not lost their job they're still with the company and they're doing great. So developers productivity will be impacted. Again, that's not true. It even makes the developer productivity to be even better than it was before. Because once people become trained and they know what they're doing, they can they move even quicker and faster because you know that is what the power that, that is the power of being skillful. But at the start, it might look very scary, but trust me, it's not as scary as people think. Developer can test, that's another myth that is not true. They just need training. Once you train them, they will be super efficient in testing. And tests will get bigger and eventually slows build down. In terms of, okay, the build time is going to slow down because, again, you're writing more tests and, and if you get to a situation whereby the test has become so big and your build time become so big as well, so you might not be able to go fast again. And this is why you've got the test engineers in place. When the bit starts to take longer, that is the responsibility. And the might start, okay, we need to start to review um, the test, what, we, what we have in our test. Some tests might become obsolete. So then we, we, st we start to get rid of those. Or sometimes maybe it, it can become bigger, but however, that's why we have a different, we have test impact analysis. You don't have to run all your tests, depending on the area of impact, you just have selective tests run if you get to that stage. But in our case, we didn't get to using testing back analysis because our beast never takes more than seven minutes. Things to avoid. I will say don't expect too much too soon because shift left is a huge, is a huge um, project to embark on. And on that, you need to understand that a lot of things needs to change mindset, culture, people getting trained, people getting retrained and stuff like that. And it's not, people are not just going to be efficient right from day one. You need to be patient with people. You need to give people time to understand the new ways of working, to understand the new process before they can become efficient. So like I said the other time, you're going to work, you're going to um, have to accept to be slow in the short term in order to be able to work faster or move quicker in the long term. So then imposing shift left on people, that's not going to work. If you want people to do something, it needs to come from their heart. You need to be able to convince them to make them understand this. there is a value in doing this. Only when they buy into it, they're going to give it their all and you're going to get the best out of it. But if you just impose it on them, trust me, it's not going to work. And not involving teams in the tool selection. So... The devs are the ones that are going to be using these tools. The test engineer are going to be the one that orchestrating these tools. So you need to involve them in the choice of tools that you want to use. Otherwise, you might have people not being happy. And if you have an unhappy employee, trust me, you're not going to get what you want out of them. So don't implement unless team feels ready. This is very important. You don't want to implement um, this approach if you feel people are not ready, if you feel your team are not ready. So the approach we took was we use a team um, to, to as a guinea pig to pilot test it. 
we did that for around six months. That worked. Then we started to roll it out in phases, in phases. So you say, okay, which team is ready next? Which team is ready next? So they know what is coming before they started. Then they prepared for it. So yeah, you need to avoid those uh, four bullet points. And I think if it is properly managed and it, and is correctly implemented, shift left, it's really, really good. And it's going to help you become more productive as a company. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Rukman. Any questions from anyone? I have a couple of questions, but let me give the chance to the audience first. Yeah, no problem. Nagendra, you have a question? Oh, yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Is this test, uh, test uh, shift left is, uh, no, is related to developers or testers? QA? Or sorry, I don't catch that question. Sorry. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah. Am I audible properly? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can hear you. I can hear yeah. you. Yeah. So when you say shift left, would it apply to developers or QA or both? It, it applies to everybody in the software development space. It's not just developers. It's not just QA. It's not just product owner. It's not just UX people. It's everybody. It's, it's everybody collaborating, working together for the quality of the software you're building. Of course, the way we've implemented it in, in MHR is that we pass on the test responsibility to developers in terms of writing the test. However, the QA engineers are the one helping them to be more efficient, helping them with the infrastructure and, uh, and test operations. Why um, the product team, they engage the test analysts right from start of the process. You have a new product that you want to build, then before they don't engage them right from start, you just need to start to engage them right from the start so that they can start asking test uh, related questions regarding those um, new features and stuff like that. So to answer your question in, 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 in simply pool, it is involving everybody. It's just that everybody plays different role. Uh, but a uh, developer who is practicing TTD is already starting from zero, right? Sorry, say that again. Develop, development, developer starting what? Developers writing, you know, main code using a TTD approach. Mm -hmm. Test-driven development. Yeah. So he, I assume that you know he starts from zero. The unit yes. testing he will start from zero. Yes. He may not you, move something. Does he need to move a little more left? This is what, they, what, what, what we implemented there is obviously we use test-driven development. We use DDD as well. But before developers, they only write unit tests. However. We shifted all other kind of tests onto the devs. So, like service tests, we had to write a new framework to accommodate for service tests so that dev can write service tests. And everything is within the same repo. So, as you start to write your unit test, you, you finish your unit test, then you move on to your uh, service test. You finish your service test, you move on to your integration test. So, you have to write all these tests before you can commit to Git. If you, but before, we implemented shift lab, it they only focus on unit test. Why the service test and integration test, the end-to-end -end test was written by the test engineers. So we shift those responsibility on to the developers. Why QA engineers focus on infrastructure and test operations. So thank you so much. No end of time. Yeah. Thank you. So related question, you said that uh, in MHR, you have shifted all the test uh, writing re responsibilities to dev. Uh, is it an industry practice to do it that way or is it particular to MHR? I think it depends on the maturity of the company. Google does the same. I'm um, not sure of, of Facebook, but Google and Microsoft, I'm 100% sure of that. And um, yeah, so we we use them as a model. Then we say, okay, let, let's try it. 
and we did try, like I did say, we had so many pushbacks, so many challenges, it wasn't easy. But at the start, it was difficult. But gradually, once you get into the nitty gritty, or once you get to understand it, it's not as complicated as you think at start. It is very scary at the start. You say, oh my God, I'm not gonna do all of these things. But once you sit down to understand it, the framework is there for you. Just write a couple of times. This is your code. You understand this code more than anyone else as a developer. It's just writing more tests. And again, they naturally, they don't like writing tests. And that is why we try to treat test code and development code as the same. So mindset shift, like I said again. So yes, that's how we navigated it. But to answer your question, simply put, it is industry practice. But again, it is very, very small company that are doing that because you need to be mature enough to be able to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Now, related to commit, you said that uh, at every commit, tests are executed. Yeah. So my question is, I'm assuming the tests are executed before the commit, not after. Oh yes, Just yes, absolutely. Yeah. Once you commit, once you commit, once you um, you know, you pray your code review is approved, that triggers the uh, automation test, and until once all those tests pass then the code is um, committed to masters. But if it's not, then it's your, your build fail and your code is rejected. Okay, but you do a commit on a separate branch. Is that what you're saying? And then the no, tests no. are triggered? No, you, once you, once you, you know, you, you commit, you do your work, you commit on your local machine, right? But once okay, you submit yeah, your PR, yeah. Yeah, you submit your PR, so that is where you run, we run our test. You can run your test locally. You can run your unit and service test locally. But once you commit, to, um, you submit your PR, that goes into the cloud. And once the reviewer is happy, they, they say, okay, I'm happy, I'm approved. Once they click that approve button, that triggers all the automated tests. Then if those tests fail, your code doesn't get into, uh, into master. The code is rejected. So you're not breaking the build for any other person. Do you get it? Because if yeah. your code is... If your code fail, if you, if your code is dodgy, but it's going to uh, master, you're going to break the build for other people. So we don't commit them into master until all the build passes. Or if, if everything is green, then everything uh, your code can be merged into master. So at least everybody can see what you've done. Because we don't want to end up breaking the build every time you break the build, then you have to fix it before. So that wastes time. We don't want that. And again, remember the code is production ready because the pipeline is automated through to production. So you don't want dodgy code to get, to get its way into production. Another question related to the job of a test engineer. Yeah. Previously, they might have been quite, uh, uh, I mean, welcoming because they had to innovate in the sense that think of new ways of testing the code. Now that whole responsibility has been shifted to dev. So maybe the test engineers feel that their role has been diminished. So how do they treat this or how do they respond to this? Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Because uh, again, this is why education, educating them is important. Let them know the, why we're repurposing their, their role. And again, uh, their job, it's not diminished. It's just that maybe before you walk in, you're picking a sandwich, but now you're actually doing the cooking, for example. So what we've just done is we want you to focus on test tooling. We want you to focus on enhancing and empowering our developers. So the developers focus on writing code and merging this code into, into, uh, into the pipeline, but the pipeline needs to be efficient. We don't want a pipeline, you know, that is running forever. So if uh, you need, they need to start thinking and doing things that will make us to be more productive, to make pro, I mean, your, your, and again, training your developers is, is another responsibility for them. Because before we pick up any ticket, let's say I'm a, de I'm a developer, I want to pick up a new ticket. Before you start your new ticket, you need to have a kickoff session. That kickoff is you discussing what you're going to do in that ticket with your test engineers. You talk about are you going to test it? You talk about uh, testability and stuff like that. Then um, we have uh, we use our Swagger docs and stuff like that as well. So because we plug those Swagger docs into our uh, test automation, 
this is again something that was that was engineered by the test automation team so there is a lot of work for them to automate so many different things and to make our production efficient our uh, you know our um, pipeline very efficient and another right type of testing that is still done by the um before i left mhr that's still done by the uh, test engineers is performance testing and that is a whole new wide world of performance testing and they start to think about accessibility testing as well so those things but before I leave, we're still thinking of if, we, if it's possible for us to shift a little bit of them, especially the accessibility to the UI developers and the pro and the performance testing, a little bit of that, not everything, onto, onto the devs. That would be cool. But a large chunk of that was still is still gonna remain with the test engineer. So they do some form of testing, but not the natural functional testing. So they never run out of work and then they become more skilled as well and uh they went into dead therefore devops as well so there's so many opportunities for them as well just because we repurpose their work yeah that's interesting uh since you also mentioned you know now test guys look at the efficiency of the pipeline yeah so maybe instead of writing tests they are writing infrastructure as code they are getting involved in that exactly. space exactly exactly yeah Any further questions from others? Go ahead. So, would uh, should we have to recommend a different direct, uh, different uh, uh, people structure? Oh, I struggle to hear all you said. Sorry, the network was not good. Can you repeat uh, that, Nagendra? Uh, so, would shift left? Does it recommend any different uh, structure of engineering team, uh, or it is just saying, uh, uh, yeah, some of the responsibilities uh, only sharing is changing, or you know. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you type it? If you can type it, I can read it and answer you. Yeah, if, I think his audio is poor. Let me try to rephrase the question. What I understood. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does shift left uh, require an organization change the way the team is structured? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, not necessarily. Again, it's different from one company to another. But in our case, not necessarily. We didn't have to change the structure. We just had to repurpose um, people's role, so to speak, but not organizational structure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So if no other questions, I think uh, we can uh, thank you, Lukman, uh, for sharing your uh, experience with Shift Left. And uh, you also gave us a feel of the subject by sh sharing that, you know, your time went down from three weeks to 25 minutes. So that's the kind of uh, efficiency that you have been able to achieve. And yeah, then the yeah. tests that are done before commit, they take hardly five minutes or maybe less. So these are very useful uh, numbers for us to keep in mind when we implement this in our workplace. Yes. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, and I would like to mention to those present that, uh, you know, Lukman has been very busy today. So he literally had to pull himself off the project uh, to give us this uh, one hour of talk. So thank you uh, very much appreciated. Thank you so much. No problem. And thank, thank you, you all for attending. Nice speaking with you all. Thank you. Yeah.